2000 was an incredible year for games. Deus Ex, Diablo 2, Red Alert 2, Counter-Strike, and dozens more. I could make an entire mini-me style series of videos based exclusively on graphically impressive games from 2000 and get 20 videos out of it. One of the many studios producing titles at the time was Monolith Productions, not to be confused with Monolith Soft, who was also producing games around the same time. Monolith Productions released games such as Blood, Blood 2, Shogo, Mobile Armored Division, and Septera Core Legacy of the Creator, a smaller development studio with a reputation for developing a single game at a time and mostly delivering quality products. Though Shogo didn't sell incredibly and Blood 2 wasn't in the best shape when it launched, the studio was still mostly considered to be a pretty high quality developer. 20 years ago, as the 90s were rolling to their end, the cultural zeitgeist was filled with spy thrillers such as Pierce Brosnan's James Bond and goofy comedies like American Pie and Office Space. But one franchise merged the two and saw incredible success. Austin Powers, a retro spy comedy that managed to delight audiences to the tune of over $375 million. And it was into this world that Monolith would release their next title. Taking a slightly less slapstick tone, more in the vein of Our Man Flint, a 60s-era parody of James Bond itself, they would release the operative No One Lives Forever, in November of 2000 to rave reviews. Today, many list it as one of the top games of the 2000s. Some rank it even higher as one of the best games ever made, and it was nominated and won many Game of the Year awards. Since this is a game you may not have heard of today, let me put it into perspective. It was called the best game since Half-Life in the same year that Deus Ex and Time Splitters was released. This was a major success story for Monolith. And of course, it was followed up with a sequel, No One Lives Forever 2, A Spy in Harm's Way, which was equally well received, won several Game of the Year awards and other awards, best music, best writing, best action game. This was another major success story. No One Lives Forever as a series follows Kate Archer, a British super spy in a colorful, well-written comedy action game taking place in the 60s. This was a highly calculated mashup at the time. Kate Archer was a female because Monolith wanted to avoid being considered too closely to Goldeneye. She was nominally British because a Scottish brogue like Sean Connery was hard to understand and American just wouldn't do. It took place in the 60s so they could draw on the nostalgia of Get Smart and the success of Austin Powers. The entire assembly was designed very conscientiously and it worked. Kate Archer is hilarious, the writing is fantastic, the gunplay is solid and overall it deserves every accolade it receives. Some of the funniest moments in gaming are in these games, from playing as a sniper on Overwatch, protecting an ambassador who's too deaf and blind to realize he's being attacked by assassins, to an interrogation scene that directly pulls from Austin Powers and then subverts that trope instantly and masterfully. What kind of two-dimensional halfway do you take me for? You think I'll tell you something just because you asked me three times? I have a master's degree in economics from Princeton University. I'm not some idiot, you know. You don't even know where he is, do you? Yes, I do. What was I thinking? Why would Dmitry Volkov tell a lackey like you where he was going? Dmitry and I are very close. Very close. Mm-hmm. And I don't appreciate being called a lackey. I work very hard. It's not easy being a criminal, you know. There's a great deal of pressure. Stealthing through the missions, you would find yourself listening to conversations and reading everything in the environment because of how witty and enjoyable they were, like this conversation about a monkey. Sorry, I don't want a monkey. What do you mean? I don't want a monkey. Why not? Because I don't like monkeys. Now get that filthy beast away from me. Are you insulting my monkey? I'm sure it's a perfectly excellent monkey, but I don't want it. Now please leave, I'm very busy. Ten dollars. No, I wouldn't want the dreadful thing even if it were free. Free? You want my children to starve? If they're hungry, I suggest you feed them the monkey. Or this conversation about the prudence of killing a super spy while they're knocked out instead of allowing her to wake up and potentially escape, which of course she does later. We've already killed thousands of people, what's one more? It wasn't me that killed them. You work for the organizations I did. 
Doesn't that implicate you as well? They didn't ask me what I thought about it. Perhaps not, but you knew there was a possibility that such things could happen. Okay, maybe you're right. But that doesn't mean I want this girl with blood on my hands. Truth be told, I'd sooner kill you than her. Then I'll stop trying to convince you to throw her off the cliff. Or this conversation about a minion who's been promoted but isn't sure he's quite ready because he doesn't have a maniacal laugh. It's my laugh. I don't think it's evil enough. Uh, let's hear it. <laughs> so? Uh, it could use some work. Uh, uh, try a little deeper. <laughs> There's just so much of this, and there are so many more that I could just keep filling time. The game isn't short. This comes from a period before five-hour campaigns that cost $200 million. No, each one clocks in at 10 to 15 hours of gameplay, with several hours of cutscenes as well. And it's not just thrown together, either. The levels are tight, the gunplay is good, the writing is consistent. And today, one of those levels is even considered to be one of the most memorable in gaming history. Which says a lot, considering this is a 20-year-old game that you can't play today. Oh right, the question of why isn't there more press, more interest, more HD remakes and remasters and sequels to a game series that is so beloved by those who remember it. A game series that won multiple awards and yet if you go to Steam or GOG, you can't buy this game. It's not for sale anywhere. And the answer is, no one is quite sure who owns No One Lives Forever. It seems that would be Monolith, because that's logical. But a year after No One Lives Forever 2, they would be bought by WB Games, now known as WB Interactive Entertainment. Monolith would go on to make games like Fear, Condemned, and Shadow of Mortar under the WBIE flag, so clearly WB should own the rights. Except the first game was actually published by Fox Interactive. And Fox Interactive was eventually purchased by Vivendi Games, so Vivendi might own the rights. No, don't worry, they don't, because in 2007, Vivendi was approached by Activision. Vivendi owned Blizzard Entertainment, and Activision wanted to purchase Blizzard, but Vivendi didn't want to sell Blizzard outright, so they agreed to allow Activision to merge with Blizzard, with Vivendi owning a majority stake in the new company, and essentially taking over the rights to Vivendi Games, including any potential ownership of No One Lives Forever. So again, it's Vivendi that might own the rights, but I already told you they don't. Because in 2013, Activision Blizzard purchased itself from Vivendi, becoming a separate entity also called Activision Blizzard. So maybe Activision owns the rights to the No One Lives Forever trademark that Fox Interactive originally owned before being purchased by Vivendi. Except that 20th Century Fox also owned portions of Fox Interactive, hence the name, and therefore might also have a claim on some portion of the intellectual property, and now they're owned by Disney. The question of who owns the rights is something that seems to be pretty straightforward. You just ask. And in 2014, a company named Night Dive Studios did exactly that. They just released System Shock on GOG, and they're the same studio that remastered Wizardry and System Shock 2 for release on GOG as well, and they figured this would be easy. Monolith had, at a previous date, released the source code for No One Lives Forever 2 out into the wild to allow for mods and servers to be updated and fixed by the community, and it seemed pretty straightforward that WBIE owned the rights, because the game was made by Monolith on the Monolith LithTech engine. There really shouldn't be any mix-ups here. Except that WBIE refused to license the game to Night Dive because of the fact that they thought Activision might own the rights because of the whole Fox Interactive Vivendi thing. The problem is Activision said they didn't know. They had no idea because if they did own anything, it would be in a box from before digital storage. And it was several companies ago. There might not be any ownership, and they'd have to search through what Night Dive likened to the vault at the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark to find out. And Night Dive even took the extra steps to contact 20th Century Fox independently, just to verify they didn't own the rights. And Fox said they weren't sure that they did or didn't have a claim on the rights of the game. However, they did make an offer to Night Dive. Pay us, and we'll check to see if we own it. And if we don't own it, we'll return the money. Or make the game without paying us and then we'll check anyways, and if we do own it, we'll sue you into oblivion. 
It's funny because Activision is actually the good guys here. They said they didn't think they owned it, but would love to license it and see it released again if they did. So Night Dive decided that the best way to move forward was to put in a claim on trademark and then see who legally owned what and who comes forward. And lo and behold, they get a letter from WBIE. And this letter tells them they need to stop because WBIE owns that trademark. So Night Dive calls WBIE, says, Hey, we've been talking to you about licensing this thing. You know, what can we do here? You guys said you don't own it. Fox says they might. Activision says they probably don't. Can you help out? And in WB's credit, they agreed to help out and figure out the licensing finally. Then WB reached back out to Night Dive and simply said they had no interest in licensing the game, they had no interest in publishing the game if it was already finished, they had no interest in working with anyone, and no interest in no one lives forever, period. It's such a strange decision to make because Night Dive made a pretty good offer. They offered to pay WBIE up front, then pay them a royalty off of every game or allow WBIE to publish the game themselves, and Night Dive would take a royalty on the back end. This was essentially free money for WB, because Night Dive would take all the risk of actually coding the game, marketing the game, patching and updating the game, all the things a game developer is normally required to do, and Warner Brothers could just sit back and receive royalties. If it didn't sell at all, they'd still have their upfront payment and absolutely no loss. If it did sell, they're making money off of a property they don't monetize anymore. Again, these games are not for sale because no one knows who owns them. So this remaster or remake or enhanced edition or HD collection, whatever it may have ended up being, would have been the only way to purchase the game in the past 10 years. It's literally a dead IP right now, making no money for anyone, and WB said no. This is so frustrating, not just for the developer who wanted to make some money off of selling the game on GOG or Steam, because of course they wanted to make a profit. It's also frustrating for gamers who don't get to play the game again, or for the first time. The original No One is basically unplayable on modern PCs. It takes hours to get it to play, and even then everything is based on the frames per second, so the entire game runs at hyperspeed. The sequel is a bit better, but even it wouldn't be playable if not for the fact that the community around the game is very strong. People have spent years fixing this game and making it compatible with modern day computers, and additionally acting as archivists, providing ways to download and play the game as abandoned considering there is no legitimate way to purchase and play it. There's no way to give any company money in return for playing this game series. They take the risk of being arrested for facilitating piracy in order to allow people to experience this incredibly cool game series. I don't know that I have that kind of passion for any game, but it allowed me to enjoy the series again. I bought the game back in the day, so I'm pretty sure I still own a license just in case W. WBIE wants to send me a scary letter. So what's the current situation? Who owns No One Lives Forever? We still have no idea. There is one small change. 20th Century Fox has been purchased by Disney, so maybe they would be willing to check and see if they own the IP. And if they do, maybe they'd be willing to consider licensing it. Of course, that still doesn't solve the problem of WB's unwillingness, and even further, whether or not Warner Brothers would even be willing to work with their chief rival, Disney. Disney, but at least there's still hope. Did you play either of these games? I don't include Contract Jack on purpose, mind you, it wasn't in the same class. Much more generic and forgettable and ultimately not very good. No One Lives Forever 2 specifically sits in a warm place in my heart because of memories of playing Deathmatch on the snow map with the snowmobiles, running friends over and sniping across the hills. If you enjoyed this video, please share it on Reddit because it really helps us out, but of course, feel free not to. You can watch another video in the corner right now, and as always, we'll see you on the next one.